This is CBC Here and Now. It's going to be tomorrow through tomorrow evening before things start hitting the grocery stores again. High winds for days, power outages and freezing weather in several towns. And closures across the province today. And this weather system hasn't left us yet. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. Police are at the scene of a head-on collision in this windy weather. A car and tractor trailer collided on Route 220 between St. Lawrence and Lewins Cove. One man is in hospital. Now the Buren Peninsula RFCMP are warning the public to use extreme caution and to expect delays in the area. And wind has been whipping the entire province all day. Here now's Katie Breen is out in that wind tonight. So Katie, how's everything looking? Well, it's it's kind of cold out here, I'm not going to lie to you. And I've actually been speaking to people across the province today, all the different corners, and the consensus is it's just not fit. I spoke to a trapped truck driver who's stranded because of the ferries. I spoke to a woman who just loves to see the outside temperature, no matter what it's like, whatever the weather, she likes it. She goes and takes videos. We're going to see some of those. Also spoke to a woman up in Maine where the community has been, at least part of the community has been in a blackout for at least a day and a half with no real end in sight. We're going to get uh, to all those stories in a more fuller version later in the show. But first, we're going to head back inside where Ashley is a little bit warmer than I am. <laughs> Yes, yes, I certainly am. Uh, Katie, the good news is, though, all those uh, uh, temperatures that you're talking about are actually going to warm up as we head towards midweek. But first, that wind that really has been the story, the winds have died down quite a bit for most of uh, the island up through Labrador, that's not the case. Cartwright seeing uh, gusts of about 102 kilometers per hour. Still have a number of blizzard warnings in place from Cartwright up through to Makovic. Extreme cold warning for Labrador City overnight tonight, looking at wind chills between minus 45 and minus 50. And if we take a look at some of the numbers up through uh, Labrador, Nain has been walloped with 64 centimeters of snow. Those strong winds in Mikovic, also 103 centimeters has fallen since Friday with this storm system. Uh, number of winds between 80 and 90 kilometers per hour. The peak was Porta Basket 139 kilometers per hour and then St. John seeing 115. So definitely seeing uh, these strong winds. And like I said, the good news is things will start to ease as we head through uh, at least the next couple of days. Otherwise, we do still have those snow squall warnings in place along the West Coast between 20 to 30 centimeters has already fallen. But through the night tonight, we are going to see the uh, system pull away, which means all of that snow will eventually pull away right with it. But those temperatures are going to dip heading into Tuesday night and Wednesday, and that's because a ridge of high pressure moves in. I'll have all those details in your full forecast when I come back. Walking your dog off leash is against the law, but everybody's doing it here at Three Pond Barrens. Coming up, we'll speak with one group of dog owners who feels that the city needs to rethink the rules. We'll hear their argument for making Three Pond Barrens an off leash dog park coming up. Well, who saw what and when? Dale Porter's friends testified today at the Al Potter murder trial, but very little was said about what they saw at the bar the night that their friend was killed. Ariana Kellen is following the story for Here and Now, and she joins us live now with the very latest from our newsroom. Ariana, what can you tell us about these friends? Well, Anthony, I can't tell you their names, and that's because a judge put a publication ban on their names earlier today. But what I can say is that these three young men appeared very reluctant to take the stand today, often keeping their gazes and their voices low as they recalled the last night of their friend Dale Porter's life. They say they were drinking at Porter's North River home on June 28, 2014, and because of how much they drank, they say their memories are hazy. From Porter's house, they got a cab to a bar in Bay Roberts where they drank some more. But who else was there and just who Dale Porter left the bar with that night? Well, those are questions none of the witnesses could or would answer. One man, clearly hesitant to talk, said he saw Porter leave with two men and a woman. When others were asked about their earlier police statements, when they said they saw Porter at the bar with a bigger man and a smaller sized man, the witnesses said they could no longer recall. 
Now that's what the court heard this morning, but this afternoon the defense really hammered on some of the officers who were on this case, including the primary investigator. Take a look at these pictures. They were taken on July 3rd, 2014 in Brigus. Uh, it shows a knife that was found in a freshwater stream. A police officer took it and seized the knife, but after questioning from the defense, the officer said he wasn't the first person to find it, that someone else had made the discovery contacted police and were told to put the knife back where they found it. Now this prompted the defense to point out the issue of evidence contamination. The court then heard that Al Potter was arrested less than a week after Porter's death. He was told that he'd be charged with murder, but he was ultimately released. But while he was in custody, police got a warrant to take his clothing. And as we've heard, one of his pieces of clothing, a hoodie, was tested for DNA and it had Dale Porter's blood on it. Now, the defense suggested that police never intended on charging Al Potter, but arrested him as a ruse to collect his clothing without grounds. That's an allegation that the primary investigator denies. More witnesses are expected to take the stand tomorrow. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Arianna Kelland in St. John's. A man has been found not guilty of drug trafficking after saying he didn't know Percocet is a controlled substance. 32-year-old Shane Leonard was facing a charge of conspiring to traffic a controlled substance but today, a judge acquitted Leonard, saying it had not been proven that the man knew Percocet contained oxycodone, which is a controlled substance. Now, last December, Leonard testified that he sold Percocet to at least three people, but his lawyer asked the judge to dismiss the charge after Leonard testified that he didn't know Percocet contained oxycodone and he didn't know it was illegal to sell Percocet. Leonard is one of a number of men charged as part of police operation that? Bombard, in 2016, he's believed to have ties to the Viking Motorcycle Club. And still with news from the courts and an update on a story we've been following for about three years now. It's about a Newfoundland man who says he was sexually abused at a cadet camp in Nova Scotia nearly five decades ago. John Doe first spoke with us three years ago. Back in 1970, he was just 15 years old when he went to a cadet camp at Greenwood in Nova Scotia. He says a 21-year-old training officer sexually abused him there. He blames the Department of National Defense. So he sued them for negligence. The judge recently made her ruling in John Doe's case. She agreed that he had been abused at Greenwood, but ruled that the military isn't liable for what happened. She said the evidence didn't prove the staff weren't appropriately screened and no red flags were ever raised about that officer. The lawyer for John Doe says his client is deeply disappointed with the decision and plans to appeal. Well, some people are calling for a rule change on a popular trail in St. John's. Three Pond Barrens is an isolated area in the upper part of P Pippi Park. Mm -hmm. And it's a favorite spot for people looking to let their dogs run around off leash, even though that's against the law. And Carolyn, I'm not accusing you of a crime, but uh, you spoke with somebody who's rallying support to change that. And you also showed up with one of your own furry friends. I did. All right, let's take a look. Let's go, Tulip. If you're one of the many people who like to come up here to Three Pond Barrens to walk your dog, you know that the majority of dog owners like to let their dogs run around off leash. It's against the law, but everybody's doing it. And we mean everybody. Within minutes of arriving, the first of many off leash dogs is spotted. There is a sign at the entrance saying all dogs must be on a leash. You can't miss it, but everyone seems to ignore it. The person who owns this dog, and this dog, and these dogs. So many happy pooches running around and exploring and socializing, all except these two. On this day, Josh Smith is keeping his two dogs on a leash. This is Summer, uh -huh. and this is Chloe, okay. and they're both good girls. <laughs> But they're not happy about that leash. And for good reason, Smith admits on a normal day, he's one of the many culprits who lets his dogs run freely at Three Pond Barrens. He's just not going to do it on TV. And she wants to go right now. <laughs> she wants to run. <laughs> <laughs> she sure does. I wish I could let her. A lot of people want to be able to take their dogs and enjoy nature unrestricted. Three Pond Barrens just seems like the logical choice. And that's why he started a Facebook group to gather support for the idea of designating Three Pond Barrens as an official off-leash dog walking trail. 
it's always been a point of contention up here, so at least now it's out in the open and people are talking about it. He feels the change would actually be better for people who are intimidated by dogs because then expectations would mirror reality. What we hope to achieve here is, you know, it, let it be known that this is a designated off-leash spot and if you come here, expect that. The group plans to start a petition with the hope of convincing the Pippi Park Commission and the City of St. John's to allow off-leash activity, which would essentially maintain the status quo but make it above board. There's many places to walk your dog on leash here in the city. Um, I think that it wouldn't be far-fetched to have this place just the only spot for an off-leash park. Uh, right now, I just don't see that as being an option that the board would look at. Sean Kelly of the Pippi Park Commission is quick to dash any hope of changing the rules. He says the park belongs to everyone, and not everyone likes dogs. This is a popular spot, I know, but it is a park. Mm -hmm. And that's the important thing that people need to know is that it's a park. Um, in none of the provincial parks or national parks um, in the province are you allowed to keep a dog off leash. Mm -hmm. So we're no different. Our rule uh, will remain the same and we're just hoping that people will start to abide by it more. He says the commission plans to install bigger signs to reinforce the rules and will try to get the message out through social media. I don't think it will solve the problem, no. I, I, I don't think you'd see 100% of people uh, put their dogs on leash just because we put up a bigger sign. But I think what it would do is just reinforce that message that, you know, you're not the only ones using the park and you have to be respectful of the people who are out walking and are nervous or intimidated about dogs. But don't expect to see any enforcement of the rules. Kelly says it's such a large area, they don't have the resources for patrols or ticketing or surveillance cameras. We don't think that that would be, you know, the desired approach. Really, if you've got a multi-use park and it's a beautiful park and everybody should be allowed to enjoy it, then really what we want to see is, is that, is that people just take ownership of the park themselves um, and work with each other to uh, allow everybody to enjoy the park. So for Summer and Chloe, it'll stay status quo. They just need to wait for that annoying camera to turn off. All right, Sean Kelly, you didn't convert them despite no. the cuteness of all the dogs. They're pretty hard no <laughs> it was. from Pippi Park. Yeah, but you know, uh, that group, that Facebook group, it is brand new and they do plan to put together a petition. So you never know if they get enough support, they might uh, sway the powers that be. And other provinces do have like large nature trails uh, designated for off-leash activities. So. All right, it's one of those things dog lovers feel strongly, others. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Uh, do you think should leash or not to leash? Let us know. And here's how you can get in touch. You can email us at hereandnow.nl at cbc.ca or send us a message on Facebook or on Twitter at CBCNL. Did you catch that? These students are teaming up with a St. John's songwriter. And they're doing it all in French. Uh, it's the year of the pig. The Chinese Association of Newfoundland and Labrador rang in the Lunar New Year Saturday night at the Royal Canadian Legion in Pleasantville in St. John's. In the Chinese zodiac calendar, the year of the pig is supposed to be a good year to make money and invest. The pig is a symbol of intelligence and prosperity. Mm -hmm. All right, make some more money. Mm -hmm. You're a goat, right? I am a goat. Okay. <laughs> but that means you're uh, loving and selfless even when it's not in your own interest. Yes, you must have looked that up. I did. <laughs> I did. I don't know these things off by heart. We'll talk dragons later. <laughs>
Welcome back to Hearing Now. And as we told you earlier in the show, weather warnings across the province today. Blizzard conditions for Labrador, snow squalls and high winds for the west and south coast of the island. So pretty nasty. Mm -hmm. And you heard earlier about blackouts in Nain where they're absolutely buried in snow. Our Katie Breen standing by here in St. John's because Katie is a trooper. How's it, <laughs> How's it looking out there? Oh, uh, well, it's, it's windy out here, but the, the real thing about this storm is that it's really touched every single pocket of this province. Was speaking to all kinds of folks all weekend, and that's when the weather started on Friday, and it just, it really hasn't quit. We're going to hop around the province, starting near Red Harbor on the Buren Peninsula. Police were cleaning up from this crash today. The accident happened yesterday afternoon. The trailer was loaded down with food, but police say high winds were still able to tip it over. It blocked the road for about four hours. The trailer is totally destroyed. The driver was treated and has been released. In Port of Basque, truckers are in a different situation. The ferry hasn't gone back and forth to the mainland since Friday morning. Marine Atlantic says about 200 tractor trailers are lined up to cross. Darren Dodge is waiting for them to arrive so he can transport food back towards St. John's. He's been stuck sleeping in his truck since Friday. Well, you might see every now and then the gust will hit the truck and you'll see things start to rock and move here. It's, it's, it's been a rocky night, that's for sure. And uh, uh, I guess it, I'm used to it, 30 years of doing this, so it's kind of become, you know, just it rocks me to sleep. Marine Atlantic says crossing should start up again tomorrow and it's going to work to get the backlog through. Now Dodge is able to flick his ignition to stay warm, but lots of the area has been without power today. These shots are in Codroy Valley, or at least what you can see of Codroy Valley. Whiteout conditions there haven't been helping with power restoration, and you can see why the ferry isn't going. In Cornerbrook, a big dig. Schools there and across most of the province were closed most, if not all of the day. In Happy Valley Goose Bay, more snow. We are starting to truck it away because we're running out of space here. And I think, yeah, in the summer you look around and you think everything's so spread out in this town, but it's for a reason, right? It's, yeah. Look at all the snow we have. Okay. But yeah, we truck it away when it gets too much. You could say people want it to stop. It's piling up and with the wind, it's blowing around, creating even more shoveling. Nain is dealing with that but also with a blackout. Weather knocked out the community yesterday morning. Most of it has been brought back on, but NL Hydro says they can't fix about 40 customers. Crews are ready to go, but they're on weather delay and can't fly in. Lisa Ivany has set up a warming shelter at the community center, and she's inviting everyone in. I could see my breath out here, but Lisa Ivany says she could see her breath inside her house. It was so cold last night that her granddaughter crawled into bed with her just to try and stay warm. I mean, it's cold. It's cold here, but I don't know the temperature. Ashley, what is it? Well, right now, outside, uh, sitting around the province, for you, what you're feeling uh, is minus 10 right now. Otherwise, we're seeing temperatures in the minus teens. Now, temperatures up through Labrador, especially coastal Labrador, are much warmer. Uh, taking a look at these numbers, minus 12 for name, but this morning, that was sitting at minus 0 0.1 degree. Now, factor in that wind chill, though. It's much colder, so it's feeling closer to the minus 20s for St. John's, and then we're seeing that for uh, the rest of along the northeast coast today as well. Now, as we head through the night tonight, we're going to uh, see these snow squalls continue. We can see it right now on the satellite radar, just barely, but we're starting to see some more uh, snow squalls move through Port of Basque as well. And if we take a look at where we have those snow squall warnings, I anticipate these will continue through the night tonight. Eventually, those winds will shift and we'll likely see those warnings ending. But those uh, blizzard warnings still on and along the coast of Labrador from Akovic to Cartwright, those winds are going to stay strong tonight and an extreme cold warning for Lab City, minus 45 to minus 50 with those wind chills tonight. So here's a look at your forecast. We're still seeing those snow squalls. We could see about two to four more centimeters along the west coast. Those northwest winds near 60 kilometers per hour tonight. Along the northeast coast as well, we could see some accumulating snow somewhere between two to four centimeters. But those temperatures not moving much from what we're seeing right now, anywhere from uh, minus eight in St. John's to minus 13 in Grand Falls, Windsor. Now the temperatures are going to climb a couple 
couple of degrees and then drop again uh, into the afternoon tomorrow. So here's a look at your forecast up through Labrador minus 31 in Lab City should clear out though because we're starting to edge into that ridge of high pressure that's going to dominate as we head through the day on Wednesday. But again, blizzard conditions continuing for Cartwright. Those temperatures are going to drop northwest winds gusting upwards of about 100 kilometers per hour tonight. So taking a look at the future tracker added those uh, the temperatures on there as well. You can see staying quite cold up through Labrador City and then for uh, the island again not moving much so minus seven uh, through the afternoon tomorrow. Then that ridge of high pressure starts to move in late day Tuesday into Wednesday morning. Look at these temperatures dipping down into the minus teens. Uh, we could see temperatures dipping into the minus 20s for low lying areas as well. So here's a closer look at your forecast for tomorrow. Sunshine should be the story for the Beer and Peninsula as we see that wind shift and that potential for those snow squalls ending. Uh, you're going to see along the northeast coast, though, still looking at that potential for some lingering uh, cloud cover and flurry activity tomorrow. Some northwest winds still uh, quite gusty, upwards of about 60 kilometers per hour. That will be the story for most of the island tomorrow. Again, that potential for some flurries for central. Uh, Twilling Gate minus 8 tomorrow. Harbor Breton sitting at minus seven through the afternoon with plenty of sunshine. Temperatures along the west coast, though, dipping into the minus double digits, so minus 10 for Stephenville. Again, those stronger winds. Bavert uh, looking at about minus eight and then up through Cartwright. Winds will finally ease, though. It'll be nice. Minus 13 with that potential for flurries in the first half of the day and then skies clear out. And that's because, again, that ridge of high pressure moves in. Minus 21 your afternoon high tomorrow for Lab City and then minus 18 for Nain and plenty of sunshine. So that's a look at your forecast. I'll have a little bit further ahead when I come back. This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today. Well, writing songs is hard. Writing songs in a different language is harder, but students at Vanier Elementary took up the challenge to write a tune in French with an assist from musician Colleen Power. And now the students are ready to share their chanson. I almost said chansons. <laughs> uh, thank you, teleprompter. They're ready to share their chansons with the world. Here now is Zach Gowdy has that story. If you don't speak French, you may not understand the words, but you can still tell this is a catchy tune. These French immersion students wrote it themselves with some professional help. So we took the grade four, five, and six classes here at Vanny Elementary and we decided to create French songs. This is a, a project that we had applied for with Art Smarts program and it's a really great project that we wanted to do but we've always felt that projects that we do do on a larger scale are English. So it was nice to do something that was project-based learning in French uh, and thankfully uh, Art Smarts connected us with a local artist who actually records in French, Colleen Power. You know what? They did most of the work themselves, so I'm just there basically to help guide them through a, the songwriting structure, um, help them come up with a few rhymes if they're stuck. Each class had a theme for their song. The grade six class wrote a rap about Canadian identity. The grade fives sang about history and how much the world has changed, especially for kids. The grade four class took on the extra challenge of doing a music video. They also picked a theme that was tough to crack, rocks. Not rock music, literal rocks. Well, we had to learn about different types of rocks so we could write a song about them. So we had to do a lot of research about them and write like courses about rocks. It's hard to write a song about rocks. Yeah, it's pretty hard because rocks you don't like use, like they aren't in your hands every day. When the songs were written, Power recorded them, added some studio magic, then she debuted the finished tracks for the whole group to hear together. It was super cool to have a professional guitar singer, and I'm sure she does other instruments, someone like that with us. Through the project, the students learned some important lessons about songwriting. 
that, it's really hard, and it takes a long time to do. It's not really easy to write verses in a day. It takes several days. It's a big project. But the other big lesson is how good it feels to listen to a song you wrote yourself. It felt really great to write one because it's something of your own. We love our whole class. It was really fun. Si vous voulez entendre les chansons complètes, vous pouvez trouver sur notre site web. And again, in English, if you'd like to hear the completed songs, you'll find them on our website, cbc.ca slash NL. Zach Audi, CBC News, St. John's. Yeah, bilingual reporter, Monsieur Goudy. The Rooms has unveiled the new art exhibitions on display this winter. Hey, there was a reception everybody. on Friday night at the province's main museum and art gallery to unveil the exhibitions. Five of the seven new shows highlight the work of artists who live in Newfoundland and Labrador, including Manfred Buchheit, Nelson White, and Philippa Jones. We are here to celebrate tonight all of the artists, and this is a very ambitious schedule for the rooms to be able to have seven new exhibitions right here. And I have to say, it's impressive to see how many artists that are featured here have made Newfoundland and Labrador their home. Well, this is the bra chain uh, for breast cancer awareness. A sight to behold. Minus 22 degrees and counting, but these women braved the cold for breast cancer.
Welcome back. Last week here now tackled the issue of daycare during a new segment that we're calling the talk. Now, during the talk, Jillian Slade, the mother of two young kids, she talked about weighing the cost of child care and whether going to work was worth it. The amount that it would actually cost to cover universal child care or affordable child care, um, the economic stimulus, like the spin-off that it would cause, I mean, we don't have any disposable income probably for the next year or two years. And I just think that it's viewed as a social issue when it's mm -hmm. actually an economic issue. Well, after that item, we thought it'd be a good idea to get an update. Al Hawkins, Minister of Education, also responsible for early child development. So what's the latest on what's happening in daycare in Newfoundland and Labrador? Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Anthony, for the opportunity. And obviously, I did see uh, the interview last week as well, and, and fully understand that there are frustrations and, and challenges that uh, uh, adults and parents face when mm -hmm. it comes to uh, child care. However, uh, you know, this uh, past week, uh, we've, we've got some good indicators uh, from a national report that was done that St. John's really is uh, the one of the only 28 uh, cities that were surveyed that actually saw a decrease in fees. Our government has, has really been uh, committed uh, to uh, making affordable um, uh, day, day uh, care or child care centers and, and making it easier for, for parents uh, to be able to put their children in these uh, child care centers. And so uh, we've actually put in place um, some fees, uh, maximum fees that can be charged. And in, these are in actually licensed child care centers, which now will give the opportunity for parents to be able to take advantage of that. And we've, we've put in place an um, operating grant uh, program that will help subsidize uh, and make it uh, cheaper and, right. and more uh, cost effective for these parents. So the deal for those centers is the government will subsidize, but you can't charge above a certain rate, right? That's Correct. how it works? And, and we, we do have a fair number that, have, um, that are in our program. As you know, of course, uh, we signed a bilateral agreement with the federal government, it's $22 million, and in budget 2017, uh, we put an additional $2 million per year into our child care centers. That alone has uh, made provisions for over a thousand uh, affordable spaces. Right. And we also... Uh, Would that be a thousand pre-existing spaces yeah. that were no, made affordable? No, uh, new? That's, new, that's new. And as a matter of fact, uh, we've uh, since uh, 2015, we've created uh, over 960 uh, additional uh, spaces. And so with that, uh, with, with that program, program in place and, and the subsidizing, it, it has enabled, it, it's, it's more affordable and accessible for, for parents to take advantage of the program. Do we have any idea of the actual demand out there? I mean, what, how close, how far are we from actually meeting that demand for affordable daycare? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, one of the areas that we wanted to uh, focus on, and our government has done that, is, is to ensure that we do have adequate spaces out there. And, and of course, uh, we've also increased the threshold for income from uh, 27,000 to 32,000 as a family income. And this year will be qualify 35 for the, for the full subsidy. Right. And uh, that in itself, we, we made full subsidies available for an additional 100 families. And now with the 35,000, the next year, we, we have, there will be additional families that will be able to take advantage of the full subsidy. Right. That uh, will create a, another 560 families that will be fully subsidized. Right, so it's going the right way. And it's going in the right direction. And uh, we've, we've certainly, uh, you know, in, in our way forward, um, affordable uh, child care centers is, is where we want to go. And we still know that we, we do have a, uh, you know, we've, we've got a bit of work to do. And we're also now looking at um, making these uh, grants available to uh, um, licensed, regulated uh, family home uh, daycares or, or child care centers as well. And so we know that as we move that forward with that, that we're going to be seeing an okay. improvement. Let me ask you a last question. So in Alberta, the affordable rate is $20. Mm -hmm. Quebec's even less. So Mr. Hawkins, where do you see affordable daycare fitting in with a strategy to get people to stay in this province yeah. or maybe even come to this province? Yeah. Which, is, which is a very good question. And we, you know, we found that uh, with this report now, uh, back in uh, 2014, uh, you know, St. John's was the second highest, uh, next only to Toronto. We've now moved to the middle of the pack. 
And uh, with, I think, the initiatives that we're putting in place, we will make improvements in that area. Quebec is a little bit off-centered in that because, you know, four of the cities, they, they do have uh, a significant lower rate when it comes to uh, child care centers. Uh, but the other uh, cities across the, the uh, country now, more in line. we're more in line, and uh, that's where we need to go. We, we need to make continued improvements, and it's been a commitment from our government that we will continue to do that. And what we, while we know we're not there yet, uh, we have made a significant improvement in, in uh, those rates uh, for, for parents that okay. are living in the province. Mr. Hawkins, appreciate that. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank Thanks. you, Anthony. Thank you. As much as I'm trying to concentrate on my work here, you're, you're usually engaged in the stories that brought the person here. Immortalized in ink, tattoo artist Dave Monroe explains why he uses his work to help cancer patients. More photos for you now of the Lunar New Year celebration from this weekend in St. John's. Mm -hmm. Now, Year of the Pig, as I mentioned earlier. Yes, and you also mentioned earlier that I'm a goat. Yes. And you're a dragon, and I, I looked you up. Uh huh. <laughs> and uh -oh. it says that you have authority. Yes. You're successful. Uh huh. You're clever. Okay. All very good things, but you can be conceited. Really? And overconfident. What? And arrogant. Arrogant? <laughs> Not Wah. you, really. Wah. <laughs> Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, for its ninth year, Trouble Bound Studio in St. John's has been trading designs for donations. Mm -hmm. The tattoo parlor is donating all proceeds raised from cancer ribbons drawn this weekend to Daffodil Place. That's a housing facility for people who have to travel to St. John's for their treatment. Here and Now's Jeremy Eaton swung by the studio. The fundraiser we're doing is a tattoo marathon. Uh, we charge $100 for the tattoos. All the money that is raised goes to Daffodil Place. We've been doing it now for nine years. It started off a little selfish. It started off because I was having uh, a difficult time dealing with the loss of my brother to brain cancer. As a coping mechanism on his birthday, I decided it would be better to work than dwell on my own thoughts. Because I wanted to get a memorial tattoo because my father passed away in September. It changed it dramatically. I didn't even know he was sick. He found out he had it and he died the next week. Hello. 
I love it. it it's kind of an emotional roller coaster. Uh, you're working, you're, and you're working through a lot of stuff with a lot of people. So, you, you know, as much as I'm trying to concentrate on my work, you're, you're, you're usually engaged in the stories that brought the person here. Between the staff, we'll probably do at least 45 tattoos. Uh, a lot of the times, if we have a moment to squeeze someone in, we'll try to squeeze them in as well. Uh, normally, we end up with a very large cancellation list. Every year that we've done the fundraiser, we have actually had a wait list from the year prior. So we'll usually contact those people first. So 10 to 15 names are just people that we weren't able to accommodate the year prior, usually. My grandfather's had cancer like eight times now. so. And he's actually in the next week, I got to bring him back in next week and he's going to be staying at Daffodil Place for a month. So like as soon as I seen him, I just knew it was something that I wanted. What do you think your pop's going to think when he sees this tattoo when you bring him into Daffodil Place in a few weeks? I don't know. It could be interesting because I did mention to him that I was thinking about it, but I was on the cancellation list when I told him. And then like as I was driving in yesterday, I got a call saying there was an opening. So no one really knows I'm doing it. So. We'll just wait and see when I get home tomorrow. Uh, so they went and I had two grandmothers that both um, were diagnosed with cancer, one with colon cancer, and she passed away. And then I had another grandmother that had breast cancer. She was a survivor of that. On my ankle, um, and there's the blue for the colon cancer for my one grandmother, and then that's blended into a pink for my grandma with breast cancer. This is actually one of the most important days in our year. Um, not just for the fundraiser, but for the impact it has on the people who are surrounding our, our particular community. So it, uh, it will always be a major uh, part of, of, of how we position everything in the shop. It's amazing. <laughs> I love it. Well, it's amazing. But there's also another way to actually raise cancer awareness. If you were on Signal Hill over the weekend, you weren't seeing things. There actually was a two kilometer chain of bras pushed right up to Signal Hill this weekend. Yeah, about 3,000 bras, if you're wondering. They fluttered in a show of support for breast cancer survivors to raise money and awareness for the disease. Have a look. What, uh, what's going on here today? What are you guys doing? Well, this is the bra chain uh, for breast cancer awareness, uh, hoping to help our community, our cancer community, and help support the Iris Kirby Center with all the donations of these bras. So we got all these people gathered, 6,600 feet of bras, roughly 3,000 bras. So we got to try to get up Signal Hill <laughs> to get all these out. Started with the Breast and Beautiful calendar, which is over a year ago. And we provided, um, that's to go to the Dr. H. Bliss Patient and Family Support Fund. And then we did it, we just randomly decided to put a bra on a moose. That was an impromptu kind of fun thing. And then we started getting bras. And then I was like, well, what are we gonna do with the bras? And it's like, we might as well do something monumental. And I did some research online for international organizations with breast cancer. And the bra chain's been done all over the world. I've been involved with breast cancer now for eight years. I am a survivor. It's been a up and down journey. Um, but everyone's journey is so different and, you know, just to be here to witness this is for everything that I have gone through. It's worth every moment of the journey. It was a random person, I don't know, um, paid for my ticket home from Edmonton to St. John's for me to be up there today behind here standing proud. Standing proud and, like I said, Whoever it is that did this for me, to be here to support Newfoundland and Labrador, um, I don't know who it is, but I hope they're watching. I really do. It's kind of like battle, you know? We all marched up there to represent somebody that's in a battle for their life. And in some small way, we don't, some of us don't understand what cancer is like. We haven't experienced it personally. But I want everybody in this province to know that everybody here was touched by cancer. We love our community and we want to support and inspire you. And you know what? It's a testament. We're out in minus 23 With degrees. Yeah. yeah, and everybody's in good spirits and we've had a wonderful time. I mean, for me, going back to Prague that November, 50 years after I'd first left as a refugee, 40 years after I'd left as a refugee for the second time, it was a kind of personal vindication. Remembering a veteran CBC correspondent. That's ahead.
we take the river run to the Ashawanapi Reunion, a Labrador archival special. Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Any luck that cold is a thing of the past? Oh, or I no? So. I, I no, it's horrible. Not. That won't come until the weekend. So we're definitely looking. Ooh. Yeah, once we look ahead, you might be happy if you don't like this cold weather. But mm -hmm. uh, for sure, into Wednesday, you can see not much happening on the future tracker, and that's because of ridge of high pressure is dominating. But that also means that these cooler temperatures are going to stick around. Now, Wednesday night into Thursday, the next system starts to move in. So we are going to start to see some cloud cover move in through the day, and then that snow moves in late afternoon or uh, late evening rather, and into the early morning hours. So taking a look at those temperatures, though, as I mentioned, sitting in the minus single digits yet again. And then up through uh, Labrador, staying in the minus teens along the coast towards Lab City, sitting around minus 20. Uh, sunshine, it looks like for Nain at minus 15, but uh, we are going to see that snow move in, as I said, towards the uh, overnight and morning hours. Now, there is a slight chance some models are showing that we could see a little bit of a changeover, maybe some freezing rain into the afternoon on Thursday, but again, it's a little bit too far out. So we'll see when we get a better idea of the track of that system. Otherwise, it looks like a good 10 to 15 centimeters is possible. Uh, central areas of Newfoundland likely looking at closer to five to 10 with this storm, and then it'll move through uh, through the day on Thursday for Valentine's Day and then eventually clear out into the afternoon on Friday before another system moves in on Saturday. And this one is where we'll see that significant warm up. So rain on tap and then uh, temperatures are going to stay quite warm up through Labrador. This, this will be another snow event at least for most of Labrador towards the Straits and the southeastern portions. We could see things change over to snow and then get a little bit messy as well. So here's a look at the forecast over the next five days. Tuesday again tomorrow looking uh, quite windy. Minus seven as your afternoon high on Wednesday with that snow moving in and then staying gray. It looks like uh, maybe a few flurries on Friday. Saturday those temperatures will eventually climb up. That's being a little bit liberal at minus one. Now for uh, central portions of the island temperature sitting around minus eight right through Wednesday climbing slowly as we head towards the weekend minus two on Friday and then zero degrees as Saturday rolls around with that uh, potential force and flurries as well. Now the snow squalls will eventually end tomorrow just looking at some lingering flurries and then into Tuesday and uh, or rather Thursday and Friday into Saturday is when we really start to see that warm up and then up through Labrador going to sit in the minus single digits again as we head towards the end of the work week Friday minus eight and then snow moves in again on uh, Saturday as I mentioned with uh, minus nine for western Labrador though temperature tomorrow around minus 21 plenty of sunshine then that system moves in and those temperatures moderate a little bit into the minus teens through the rest of the week so let's look at your forecast I'll have your weather photo when I come back well some sad news uh, to report this evening about one of our own veteran CBC correspondent Joe Schlesinger has died he was 90 years of age. It said a good reporter gets to the heart of a story and what Joe did in his own way was report with heart, never forgetting the people whose stories he was telling. Mm -hmm. A big inspiration for a lot of people went into this business. As Ron Charles reports, Joe's own life set the stage for a remarkable career. South Vietnamese say they have 10,000 men on the road. Joe Schlesinger's more than half a century of restless curiosity brought Canadians compelling stories from around the world. Death to America. It sounds bloodthirsty, but some of them smile as they yell. And yet Schlesinger's own life story was no less enthralling. Born into a Jewish family in Vienna in 1928, he was raised in Bratislava, Czechoslovakia. We used to live right up there. All the, the whole front there. The rise of Nazi Germany led his parents to send him and his brother to the United Kingdom. After the war, he returned to discover his parents had been killed in the Holocaust. In Prague, his English got him a job at the Associated Press News Service. But with the communist rulers cracking down on journalists, he had to escape Czechoslovakia once again. He made it through the Iron Curtain all the way to British Columbia, where he enrolled in university, edited a student newspaper, and eventually worked at a local daily. 
Soon he was on the move again to a few media jobs in Toronto, then London, and then to Paris and the International Herald Tribune. This is CBC News today. Now with a young family, he decided to return to Canada in 1966, holding editorial management positions at the CBC. No one here seems eager to die in the last moments of this war. But anxious to get back into the field, Schlesinger launched a long career as one of Canada's preeminent foreign correspondents, covering wars, disasters and revolutions across the globe. He credited his wife, whom he called Mike, and their two daughters for keeping him grounded. She kept his family together. She raised my daughters, the wonderful, educated, loving human beings. and successful too. One of Schlesinger's most compelling stories was the 1989 Velvet Revolution and the fall of communism in the former Czechoslovakia, the country he fled twice. I mean, for me, going back to Prague that November, 50 years after I'd first left as a refugee, 40 years after I'd left as a refugee for the second time, was a kind of personal vindication. Forget all that stuff about loving Paris in the springtime. August is the month to be here. What's happening here is not some outrageous abuse of human rights, but just disregard of human rights. Schlesinger officially retired from CBC in 1994, but continued to do analytical stories and documentaries for another two decades. It's such a privilege to be able to spend one's life watching the world unfold and actually being paid for it. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Well, it was a windy weekend for most of the provinces we've talked about. Any idea where this was taken? Somewhere on the Avalon. The Avalon? Mm -hmm. It's cold. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll tell you who took this shot when we come back. Welcome back to here. Now, it sounds like something out of a Liam Neeson movie, although we're not talking about wolves. No, uh, hungry polar bears have overrun a small town in northern Russia. 
Just look at that. The bears have been seen eating trash at the local landfill, exploring apartment buildings, and in some cases chasing people. The community of about 2,500 is under a state of emergency after many failed attempts to scare the animals off. Yeah, going through apartment buildings. Uh, the town says there's never been such a large invasion, and now there's a team of specialists that's been deployed to sedate and remove those large, large animals. Look at them all. Wow. So many. That is a scary, scary. Yeah. Uh, On the other hand, it's good to see so many of them. Yeah, we're always right. doing stories about how much trouble they're in. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess the Russians are doing something we're not. Yeah, they're being fed, it wow. looks like. It's just, it's amazing to me that they're not scared. And who is, why are they so close to them? <laughs> That's my question. The person who's recording? Yeah. 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 They must be that in a vehicle. Oh, they're in they a vehicle. They are, yeah. Okay. But yeah. still. He's, he's the guy throwing the steak. Yeah. <laughs> No, creatures. bad idea. No. <laughs> oh, that makes me so nervous. It does, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you could look at the weather photo. Avalon. Avalon, yep. Okay. Do you have anything, Carolyn? I know no. you were quiet. It, 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 it's, it looks like it's in black and white to me. It does look like it's in black and white, but you can see a little bit of the blue there. It's actually yeah. Holyrood. Ah. Holyrood? That's right, Holyrood. Holy 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 yeah. <laughs> I knew it too, as yeah. soon as I said it. Yeah, she, so she didn't cold. tell you it was taken in 1928. Yes. Though, right? That's a cold it's and where, not when. Well, they were out hiking in this. Vanessa was out hiking in this. So obviously it was a, a lovely afternoon, even though it was so windy and cold this weekend. But yeah, beautiful shot there. Thank you so much for sending that in. If you have any weather photos that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. That's it uh, for this Monday. We'll see you again tomorrow. Yeah. Have a great night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>